he's going to talk about, um, com uh, let's see, yeah, community paramedics and non-traditional environments. Yeah, we'll try to keep going with our theme here. Um, and Pete and I are going to do this together. We're going to split up uh, and talk a little bit about the, uh, some of our other areas. And again, going back to that idea of how the community paramedic is really interfacing with the, you know, allowing the healthcare system to bridge into the community, where we're finding a lot of uh, a lot of traction, a lot of really rich relationships, is actually a non-traditional or non-health care related, so not getting away from the clinic and that. So um, the goals of this is, uh, um, oh, I got them mixed up here. The goal of this one is to share with you about two of our specific areas where we've had really good experiences working in a non-health uh, non care related environment. Um, and then, um, so the, the objectives would be that you, Think about areas in your own work uh, where you live that might be a good place to connect with. And it's also a fertile ground for grant funding or as you're looking to sort of bridge things until we get a better consistent payment. Oh, here we go. And, um, and then the other, th so one of the things that uh, another, I, I've learned so much uh, by be becoming more and more involved in the community paramedic program, it's challenged sort of my traditional paradigm of going to the hospital and seeing people and going home and reading about ultrasound or TPA or whatever. And I want to the really, really cool, who's, who's heard of uh, the behavioral health clubhouse movement or is familiar? So uh, we'll talk a little bit about this, but it's such a neat thing. It's an international organization. Uh, I've driven by the clubhouses that exist in our na in our area, and had no idea that this cool place exists. So, uh, again, our model. Just to give you a flavor, here's, you know, this is our pie graph of all the places where we're working. Uh, these are, represent, you know, a couple patients or a, you know someone who's like, hey, I heard about the community paramedics. Can you? You know, can you go out and do, can you go weigh this baby that hasn't showed up at the clinic, you know, for two weeks and we're worried about them? Or can you do, go do some catheters on these, this, you know, older women who don't, demented people who it's disruptive to leave? But uh, I want to focus on these two areas. So there, you can see our, the green one is our chemical dependency drop-in clinic or sick call clinic. And that's a fair amount of our work. It's a long relationship. And then our clubhouse is just starting to kind of grow and grow as we get more uh, connected with them. <coughs> so uh, the, our two partners here are Vail Place, and that's the Behavioral Health Clubhouse, and I'll talk about that. And then Turning Point, which is this really neat organization that provides some emergency housing for people who are, are homeless, or, uh, but all, their main job is providing an inpatient treatment facility they, they're open to all people, but they have a specialty and a kind of a focus on African-American uh, African or black. Um, so it's, they've been great teachers. So I'm going to talk about Vail Place. Um, this, is a, this international organization is, was started when in the U.S. They, uh, we transitioned away from more kind of group housing or institutional housing centers for people with behavioral health or uh, we call them uh, serious persistent mental illness. And so these folks, uh, there's a group in New York that got discharged from their uh, group home or their institutional setting and were out on their own and found that um, they, one of the things they missed was the, the, the connection with other people. And so they came together to form a clubhouse. And so this movement has taken off and Vail Place is named for a, 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 an advocate in Minnesota, um, Dr. Vail, uh, and he started this club, or they started this clubhouse in his name, uh, with his input uh, in one of our suburbs called Hopkins. And they have a second place now where uh, it's for for us when we go in. That one of their neat themes is they say we we don't want you to be able to tell the difference between staff and clubhouse member. And so when you show up for the day, uh, you're, if you're a, a, a staff member, you do your job. 
But if you're a clubhouse member for the day, you go in and there's a list of all the things that need to occur. You know, someone needs to clean the a restroom, someone needs to work the snack bar, someone needs to help with uh, food prep, and you sign up for your different jobs, and that's what you, you do that. Uh, you hang out, they have different programs, uh, like speakers come in, they have uh, activities, there's a walking club, they have a job like advocacy and job coaching program where they look for employment opportunities for people and then they support each other. Saying, oh yeah, you know, you go to this grocery store, you ask for this manager, you go to this Target, or um, and so they, the the folk, it's a really neat network that um, I'm fortunate where I don't, I haven't needed any treatment for my mental illnesses yet, and so I didn't even know this existed, you know, and I've worked for 25 years in this area and taking care of countless people with behavioral health, mental illnesses, and never uh, realized that this <coughs> resource existed. So what we do is. Uh, once a month at each of these places we have a drop-in clinic. One is a little bit more formalized where we have a private room and to some of the JCO concerns and, and those things it's a, it's, a, it's a more traditional environment where you can sort of close the door and talk to people um, and do you know blood pressures and exam and help, navig help people navigate. Um, the other place is just kind of out in the open. It's in a corner and people drop in and what they've done is they've given us a, an office where if there's a, uh, a more private conversation that needs to occur we can pop up into there and, and have that. Uh, it's, it's so much fun and it's uh, re rejuvenating for me and for the medics when you get to work at this clinic because you get to sit, sit down with folks and, and they're, they're usually w better than when what I, we're used to seeing them when they're in crisis in the emergency department or the ambulance. And so it's really fun to sit and talk to someone when they're, and hear their questions and how they're trying to navigate the system or they just got out of the hospital and were given a bunch of new medications. And there's been some really kind of eye-opening uh, conversations, I think, that we've had with patients where we've learned from them what it's like in, in, as they navigate through the, that um, world of living with a mental illness. Um, so I would encourage if, if if when you go back home to see if there's a clubhouse in your uh, area, they're they're appropriately protective of themselves. You know, they they don't want to, you know, get the neighbors to. I think it would be very challenging. For, I think it is. Ch I know it is challenging for them to go into a neighborhood and say, "Hey, we're going to build this clubhouse or buy this house and turn it into a clubhouse." There's all the things that go along with that. But I think once you get in, they're really. Uh, uh, it's the the work they do. They're very appropriate to be super proud of. It's really, really cool. And then what's really neat for us is as we, as a system now, we've, we've come to learn about this great services and they have community, they have care navigators or equivalent of a community health worker. And so we're starting to access them more and more. And we'll, we'll encounter a challenging patient or a patient with a comorbidity of a mental illness. And now we've, uh, where maybe a year ago we were doing a lot of that care navigation on our own and again back to our we love our social workers sign um, that what has been pretty nice now is to connect so that the community paramedic can still do that sort of short-term intervention help someone in their crisis transition time and then hand them off to this care navigator who is much more knowledgeable and equipped than we are so uh, and then the other fun thing is how the, community, uh, the members of the clubhouse are starting to anticipate the visits and get to know what we can offer. So they've connected us with different places where we've gone and taught first aid or CPR training or, or even just talked about, hey, here's what the, when the ambulance shows up, here's, what, here's how you can interact in a, in a way that is less scary. So you know, I think what I was used to like taking a fire truck or an ambulance to a school and letting the little kids run around in it. It's really fun to take an ambulance to an uh, adult uh, center and have them come in and, and allow them to ask questions about what what is this or why do you do it this way so that's been a real eye-opener for me, for me and our, our medics as well so and as we said we're integrating more and more with uh, this resource with our, our health center and then um, and then back to Pete's point earlier is we are st the, the he our health care system one, this activity feels it's the right thing to do for people, and it's it's a good access point. Um, and in addition, then it's driving some business into our healthcare system, 
so our bosses are happy with that piece as well. So, so we're happy, they're happy, the, our customers are really happy too. I'm going to let Pete talk briefly about um, our turning point work and then we'll take any questions. So turning point for us was year two, I think. We got a, a phone call wondering if we could help uh, just from time to time check in. And this is a site in North Minneapolis, same neighborhood as a grocery store. And they really wanted some assistance um, with the fact that they had a very high 911 utilization, um, hundreds of calls coming out a year from one site. And what's interesting about Turning Point is that a lot of people living there maybe are stepping down from prison and know that they're at high risk for relapse and drugs and they want to actually now go to an official therapy uh, outside of what they've already done or they're moving up from the south or in from the east. The point is, is they're coming from a lot of different areas um, and not familiar with the healthcare delivery right around Turning Point. And so by offering a community paramedic, which at first we we're just kind of there similarly to what we're doing at Vail Place, infrequently check your blood pressure, write down some questions. Um, and that kind of morphed into, we have a, a full, a dedicated room for our staff. We're there 8 a.m. to noon, um, Monday through Thursday. And the two medics, I didn't know how medics would react at first when I said, you know, who wants to go work at uh, 1515 Golden Valley Road, you know, which is an address you've heard so many times as a, as a medic at two in the morning when you're trying to watch that good TV show or sleep. Um, and a couple of the guys jumped on it, uh, and one in particular. And now both the people that we have working here, I can't go down and visit there without hearing the praise from the staff, hearing, you know, oh, we love Doc, Doc's great. Uh, he's still not a doctor, uh, <laughs> community paramedic. Um, supported, embraced, appreciated. Um, our 911 call reduction continues to go down, which is great. Uh, but more than that, patients at Turning Point have been able to um, you know, the folks that are coming here for their treatment have been able to get a part of a healthcare system. Up until our presence, they were given one visit, um, a pre-treatment physical to assure that they didn't have any communicable airborne disease, and then they were, yep, you can go live in a dormitory style setting. Uh, but it was difficult because they're Rule 25 or wavered, they're on medical assistance, so again, they're not able to access all the same healthcare points. Um, they're able to access a lot more than, than normally a Medicaid or medical assistance recipient, recipient is aware of, but they need a little help in that education piece. So our staff have uh, been there now for uh, three years and continue to have high engagement with our staff wanting to work there, um, the patients, and then even when they graduate out of the 90-day stay, um, we're keeping relationships with them at times after that, but more on a on need basis. So where they where they had normally gone again offered uh, a single visit and then it was kind of you know back to the ED for your tooth pain, back to the ED for your ear pain, you know, back to the ED, back to the ED. And so by being there four times a week and building out your emergency plan, in other words, you know, you haven't had dental care in 25 years. Yep, you're going to have pain in the next few months as you start to um, dry up and you know here's the plan of what to do and no don't call wait until the morning we'll be here the door will be open come in and have that conversation so it's been great to see um, the staff stationed there it's kind of like stationing in an ambulance there and proactively having the conversation rather than just waiting to react um, so we're there like I said the four hours uh, and with that led let's see led to more probably more work than we had anticipated at times in terms of them, you know, the turning point needing help with uh, keeping track of medication, distribution. Um, we're getting into some talk of how to uh, provide Narcan um, and do some other little more aggressive offerings from the staff to the folks there, just in case anyone does uh, relapse and overdose, which happens. And then the pre-treatment physical, I think, is a huge value add of community paramedicine for the healthcare uh, industry uh, because if you can eliminate some of the, the demand on the provider's behalf ahead of time by asking questions, by doing some point of care labs, by doing some urine analysis, and send that individual into a clinic visit all prepped, 
suddenly the provider historically only has 15, maybe 20 minutes for that visit, uh, and the patient has 9,000 things that they want to talk about, but shit, I can't remember any of them. So we help patients and we say, you know, what is everything you want to talk about? And then we say, seriously, to like half of it, you know, cross that out and help them develop this list that is three things strong, let's focus on the top and let's make the most of the visit. So that's been very rewarding and then trying to get that information into what's called my chart, uh, the patient portal access point. I don't know why we get all the information on patients and they get really none of it. Uh, it's very strange. So we're trying to make sure that the patient goes home with a phone in their pocket or back to their room where they're trying to change their entire life, literally, and they have an idea of what just happened to that appointment. And they can go into their app um, and look at their chart and learn about their health. So our staff are really trying hard to be a part of that solution. In other words, have the conversation of what's going mm -hmm. on. Dental care is huge, and it's, it's huge everywhere we go. Um, you know, in the States, it's not set up for um, people. If you're low income, you just it's tough to get access to dental care. Uh, very little room to argue on that. So uh, let's see here. Is this your work? So oh, Maple Grove. Yeah. This is just um, what the, our turning point has allowed us to, to do is that preparation for the clin uh, appointments has been really valuable. And the medic's getting better and better at saying, all right, here's what you can expect at this clinic or with this provider. So let's focus, let's get you ready for that appointment. And this is a, not from our turning point work, but it's representative of, of our work. Was, when we are involved, our uh, primary care follow-up is much better. So the green line is, uh, is the community paramedic patients. And for no attendance on the, on, uh, the left, the, when the paramedics are involved, the no attendance rate drops. And uh, obviously it goes up when uh, we're involved. And we're finding the same thing with our um, work at Turning Point. So. Um, when we talk about our value proposition for the system, trying to justify why we're here, uh, it's we're u utilizing the hospital less, uh, and we're using less emergency care for patients. Um, and then we, we're happy to talk to you after. But there's some the financial benefit is we can we can make the numbers show. I, I think realistically, it's like a, a one to five return on investment, um, but we can make it look like one to eleven. Some of the programs are more like one to three, but there's a clear return on investment, uh, and it's um, we can we're happy to talk about that. Um, our gang includes all these people, so uh, and one of the things that I I think is another an analogy is in in my previous job I worked with two different uh, tactical medical teams, and what I like about the, our work at Vail Place and Turning Point, and Pete mentioned it at. Our, our medics at Turning Point, they're called DOC. And they're really beco they've become the tactical medic for the Turning Point, for the chemical dependency group. And they're, they're, they're included in that, or they're given that same kind of respect and, and uh, viewed in, in, in that, uh, you know, they're cherished parts of that organization now because of the work that, and the, the expertise they provide. So questions on, on <laughs> And so what I'd offer then, just also in, in closure, is please look and see if there's an international clubhouse or equivalent back where you live. Again, it's international. Uh, two, look for opportunities in your chemical dependency world because, again, I think it's another sort of isolated, potentially siloed group of people who do really good work with a focus on that chemical dependency part. And so they're, they welcome this opportunity to have a medical provider come in and, and be a good resource for them, so. Peter, can you go back to uh, slide 13? There it is. So you have uh, FQHC historical access point. Can you describe how you've integrated with that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is specific to historically the uh, clientele coming through Turning Point access the FQ FQHC for their pretreatment physical. Uh, and then due to a number of variables, they were enabled, unable to typically access it again. So we've partnered with Neighborhood Health Source and some other groups in the community 
just to keep conversation going of how do we provide services in, in um, oh, tandem to one another and making sure that we are offering to the community. So specifically, are you curious about FQHC kind of initial conversation or? How did you integrate with an FQHC? We didn't, no. We provided services that they were unable to for a population in this particular example. And so, and in Turning Point, this is how they were meeting their medical needs before we get, were involved, is through the uh, FQHC. And it wasn't really meeting their full needs, so. All right, you're still up if you need to call. Yeah. I apologize for my ignorance, but uh, can you, what does that acronym stand for? Federally Qualified Health is it Center. Center. 